July 4th, 1960 was a banner day for the United States of America. Yes, it was Independence Day, but something grand happened that day. Les Thatcher became a professional wrestler. Hello, everybody. This is Angelo DeCipio. Welcome to Wrestling with the Future. I'm joined tonight by a frequent guest. He is one of our favorite people, Nikita Brezhnikov. How are you, Nikki? I'm doing great. Hello, everybody. Nikki, we got a great show tonight. One of uh, one of our our comrades, for old school comrades, is here tonight. The legendary Les Thatcher himself. Let me tell everybody a little bit about Les. Les is a semi-professional. I mean, a semi-retired professional wrestler. And we always say semi-retired because pro wrestlers never really retire, do they? No. Uh, he <laughs> is a uh, a bodybuilder, a legendary trainer. He's also Quite frankly, the guy I wanted to have one because nobody can tell a tale like Les Thatcher. I've heard this man tell stories, and I said, I got to have him on. I want to hear these stories <laughs> up close and personal. I want to hear these stories. So uh, he also sits on the board of directors uh, of your favorite group, Nikki, the uh, Cauliflower Alley Club. Yes. I won't no, say that. I got to interrupt you there. No, I'm, I'm no longer on the board anymore, Angela. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't no, know that. No, it's okay. But no, I'm yeah, I'm not haven't been on the board for several years. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, he's also won several regional tag team championships with various partners, including the legendary Nelson Royal and Roger Kirby, and turned himself to the singles competition as a junior heavyweight before moving on up to wrestling with the future. How are you, you guys? What's happening? <laughs> well, that's it. We can go home now. Right? Okay, bye. <laughs> you, you, you've covered my. You you talk about stories. You just you just reminded me of a of a deal. Nick Goulas used to uh, do his own uh, promos and plug his uh, the Nick uh, the Nashville town on Nashville TV, and. Oh, yeah. But he would almost, you know, next Wednesday night, this and that, and this and that, and this and that, and here's, and, and he's going to do this to this guy and that guy. And anyway, he's got Len Rossi, and they're all taped, right? It's not live, so you can always do them over. And so Nick is telling the whole story and telling Len's going to beat him because of this, and, he, and Tojo did this to Len. And so, and Nick, and what do you think, Len? Len says, Nick, you said it all. And he walked off, and <laughs> Nick about <laughs> had a fit. <laughs> I got to tell you something, brother. We've done the last. It's funny. There's got there's like a theme going here. The last four shows I did, this show included. Nick Goulis has come up in every show, every single show. Uh, none more profoundly, however, than the show I did recently with Ron Fuller. That was a barn burner. That was a good one. Um, I got to tell you something. Uh, less in the interest of full disclosure, my ex-wife. Used to wrestle for Nick Goulas. She was uh, married at the time to David Novak of the Bounty Hunters. All right. I never knew David had a wife that wrestled. I, and I, I didn't know the Bounty Hunters real well. I was just uh, on my way. I was in. For, uh, I'd just come back out of Cal or out of uh, Eastern Canada Maritimes uh, okay. back into Nashville when they were getting their, uh, getting their start there. And I didn't stay that long. And then I went on into Tampa. So I didn't really know them either. But, uh, well, good. Then uh, you've been wrestled. Before. <laughs> then you've behaved yourself, right? Are you mean me? Please, brother. I've been I mean, pinned uh, by the best of them. <laughs> okay. Nikki, rescue me from this shit. <laughs> You put her over. Let's put it that way, and you put her over, right? I oh boy, did I, and then some. Yes. All right. And I had All to get right. the hell out of Tennessee after that. I Nick, heard that. Let's talk. Let's talk to Les. Yes, sir. You got it, brother. Les, you got to see yes. what things, things are today, and you know we don't want to sit here and be like old, angry old men and just <laughs> throw, throw crap up on the wall. But it's like you know. We talk so many times about that word respect and uh, people that want to be in this business. It's like, you know, pay those dues, but selling, that art of selling, 
we we just lost that so much and that keeps coming up in so many conversations that i'm in because people say to me what do you think is what could really help wrestling today i said sell you gotta be able to lay down to have enough respect if i'm working with Les thatcher he puts a move on me i'm not gonna get up and walk off to the dressing room just like okay i, I spilled the drink and that was it it's like no i'm hurt he beat well me. yeah I, I think you, you, you're saying sell, but that fits in the category that I say uh, there's not a lot of workers today. When I say workers now, there's wrestlers and they're acrobats and they're good athletes and they're in shape and they can do amazing things. But the one thing that uh, most of them don't do well is tell a story. And you got to be a worker to tell a story. Because you like, just no you no just, shut up, man. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, brother. I'll tell you what. You just <laughs> put your finger on something that ties right into what you and Nikki are talking about, and it's something Nikki knows. I harp on this show about a lot, and that is the lost art of psychology. Without that, there's no selling. Without that, there's no working. Without that, there's no character. What? happened to psychology where did the the ring psychology go where's all the generals at where are the, the well you see that that's the point when i when i broke into business uh, 60 plus years ago uh True. i had a lot of veterans to work with and and nobody had to teach me respect it was just something i understood and uh you know you listened and I, well, I was always a baby face, so the, whoever the heel was, you know, was going to call the match anyway. But uh, you learned. But now the a lot of the things, these kids, first of all, there's 8 million guys who will tell you they can train you and can't train themselves. And there's there's very few legitimate trainers that I would send anybody to. Oh, my and God. Uh, that's one thing. But the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of these kids, it's monkey see, monkey do. So yeah. they just do what they see on TV. Or they see something cool and it's, uh, you know, hey, I, it's so cool, I'm going to do it. But what they don't see is how that person got to that cool move and where they went from that cool move, Thank which you. is part of the story. Exactly. Exactly. That drives me nuts. You know, we had one of the... A legendary trainers on recently, Doc Diamond, who um, began the Monster Factory with uh, Larry Sharp and the Buddy Rogers way back when. when. By the way, I trained at the Monster Factory, um, one of the uh, the premier wrestling, even today still, one of the premier wrestling schools. One I've of the done, things uh, I I've done, I've done a half dozen weekend camps up there with Danny in the last oh, yeah, I know. Four, four or five years, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we, and by the way, unless is talking about Danny, he's me, Danny Cage. Uh, yeah, who yeah. runs the the Monster Fest? A great guy, great great guy. Right. Um, and he learned though. He learned from his teachers. He's giving to this generation what was given to him, which is respect, the, a show of respect for your elders. First, your elders first, the business second, and the art of ring psychology third. Because without the first two, you there is no three. No, I and that's we, a simple uh, sketch. Uh, just a month. Well, it hasn't been a month yet. Three weeks ago, I guess it was. Uh, Tom Pritchard and I did a weekend camp here, and our focus it was everybody was there had had some experience. And uh, our focus was on teaching them how to tell a story. And you'd be surprised how many of these guys had worked, or use the word work, but I'll say that. how many of these guys had wrestled for five years or six years or such, yeah. and yet didn't really know how to tell a story. And part of that was wow. I had a friend of mine put together a disc for me, and on that disc is Rogers O'Connor, 61, uh, can uh, Comiskey Park in Chicago, uh, wow. Benoit Regal from Pillman 2000, uh, Dickie Steinborn and Tommy Sigler from Atlanta in 73, uh, Brad Armstrong and Ric Flair from 89. Anyway, 
uh, and we use this and, wow. and to, you know, watch this, these people are telling a story, you know, there's a big be- exactly. beginning and a middle and an end. Yeah. And, and that's now, you know, mostly now it's just trading spots. Yes. You know, you yeah, do a exactly. spot, I do a spot. And, and honestly, and I've said this to some of these kids too, why it's just, it's public masturbation. They're it, just, it really, and it drives Nikki. And they're entertaining crazy. When themselves. The show and we talk and about I, this. It makes they're entertaining nuts. themselves. I always, yeah. I tell you, you know what, what you like personally absolutely doesn't matter. It's your, your the idea is for you to entertain the people that bought tickets. Yes. So what do they like? And that's what, that, that's the other thing. When I had my, uh, my uh, school in Cincinnati, or, or if I, you know, if I work with anybody long enough now, but everybody that came out of my place could call a match on the fly. That was a must. And here I tell these kids even today, okay, let's say Vince is paying you a million dollars to have lay it out step by step fine. But human beings make mistakes. And if you are got an elaborate finish worked out and say pop a hamstring five minutes into this 20-minute match and can't make that climb to the top, you've got to change that finish. And yep. you can't ask for a timeout. We're going back to the back and sit down and talk another half hour. No, there's no reasons. No. no. No do-overs. And, and, well, and, and because so many of these guys do it paint by numbers and lay it out in the back, they uh, don't understand the nuances like facial expressions because they're busy remembering spot 14 yes. that comes after 13. And they, they can't concentrate on how should I sell this punch? Is this the first one? Is Are we 10 minutes in? Are we two minutes in? Is this the second punch? You know, I mean, and when I talk to my trainees like that, I say, and it takes me longer to say it to you now than it, you have to think about it. Because you have hey, to react. You. Exactly. <laughs> I, I'll tell you another thing, Les. Now, see, I do both worlds. I've been the world of acting as well. And what you're describing, I can sit there and watch somebody doing a scene. And it's like, this person doesn't know their lines and they're struggling. They're not acting. They're re- reciting. They're trying to remember what words are coming up next. What Angelo's saying, then I got to respond to it. Same thing with the matches. They, these kids come out, they don't use the crowd, they don't play to the crowd, it's like they're in a box, and the crowd is looking into the box and watching, what, and I like what you said, public masturbation is the greatest description of what they're doing. Hey everybody, look at me, this is what I'm doing. But yeah. they're also killing themselves, because I said something to somebody, it was at Cauliflower Alley, and I'm like, you know, you're not going to last long. I'm watching what you're doing in there. My back hurts. This is crazy. You're not. Yeah, Nikki, killing. you and I have had that conversation. These guys are taking lives off of their, the you know, uh, light years off of their career. You know, they're 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 taking their life and just well, you know, disseminating it. You know, it, year it, by year, with every stupid, ridiculous move they do, they're just. You know, I mean, do they realize, you know, how you're what they don't re- Well, what they don't realize is that the art form is dying. And yes. the reason it is, is because we have this catch-all phrase, which is everybody's smart, but everybody isn't smart. No. I mean, uh-huh. they, under- they, they understand that the, because it's been told, the business is predetermined. The, the, the end, okay. So the other thing I try to teach is if this is the case, then you're, the strongest weapon you have is the element of surprise. So you don't telegraph your finish 10 minutes before you're ready to do it. Exactly. You don't telegraph anything. You work, you know, which again comes back to timing. And that's, you know, and the other thing is they don't understand how to cover up the other guy screwing up. How many times do you see a guy standing, bent at the waist, peeking out of the corner of his eye, waiting for that guy to finally come off that top rope? You know, and it's like, Jesus, man. <laughs> I mean, you you got to cover the other guys. It's the art form is dying in that respect. It's but you crazy. know what? The the better coaches teach guys how to call it. Pritchard does. I do. Rip Rip Rogers does. Rudy Gonzalez does. Oh, uh, it's, rip all oh, you know, it's a trip, please. Oh my god. 
Rip, oh my is, God. Rip is a hell of a train. I, oh Rip, my God! Yeah, he is. You know, Rip you, is you, Mister you, Politically you, Correct. I love. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh please. You know, <laughs> it, it, you said something important. In fact, something that that, that Nikki and I discussed on one of my last shows. Um, the element of surprise and uh, you know, and calling things on the fly. You know. Uh, and Nikki brought up a really, really interesting point. You're talking about being smart. You know, Nick, remember we had that, that conversation with Scott Teal yes. about, you know, being smartened up. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. and I asked, you know, when was the first time you were smartened up? Here's you the didn't thing smarten though. Scott up now, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I love Scott. No, he's, but, he's good people. But, anyway, go ahead. I could. But but here's the thing though, um, you know, talking about the uh, uh, Nikki, you brought up the uh, the interesting point of Hulk Hogan. Nobody saw it coming when Hogan won the title, right? Right. Nobody right. saw, you know, uh, everybody, battling. right? Everybody that was talking and telling things that were going on the inside, nobody saw that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, with Sheik, you know, beating Backlund, okay, they didn't even see that coming. Let's start right there. Because you're right, Angela. It was able to go back there a month before. And when yeah. it was told, you know, Iron Sheik beat Backlund last but he's like, what? What the hell are you talking about? But well, then the, like, the art of misdirection is part, basically part of being a worker. It always has been. I, I know uh, I always felt that Leo Garibaldi became a – a very, very good friend, but also was one of the greatest bookers I ever had the pleasure to work for. And Leo always said, you always give the people what they want, just never when they expect it. Mm, very good. You know, so, and that basically yeah. tells the story too, you know. And, right. and the other, you know, the other problem today is with, uh, they they use the same finishes uh, over so often, and sometimes the same finish twice in the same show. I Wait mean, a it's I'll just tell you one better. Stop right there. I got the classic for you, and it happened last week. I got the classic for you, and if you don't believe me, go back and watch the show, and you'll see it. In one show, in one two-hour show, the same finish was done five times. Not even oh. BSing you. Wow. Five times in a two-hour match, they did the same finish. You mean Here's a two-hour show? Here's how they got around it. Here's how they got around it. You're going to love it. Talk about misdirection. They had the referee in a different spot every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To make it look like a different finish. It's the same fucking finish. Pardon my French. But I speak fluent French. Yes, sir. Well, it's that's, I mean, same. it's just that they don't, it's again, same. they pay no attention to details because exactly. they assume everybody's smart. So that means there are no limits, right? We can be as goofy as we want to be. I, I, I'll tell you this. I had this conversation, and, and I won't throw this guy under the bus. He's a sweetheart of a guy, hell of a trainer, and uh, a dear friend. But anyway, he's quite a bit younger than I am, but... but we had this conversation a few years ago, and he said to me, he said, if you were a, a young boy today and were just getting, starting to watch wrestling, would it make you want to be a wrestler? And I didn't have to wait to answer. I said no. And he said, me either. Hmm. So What does that I, tell you? Understood. I mean, think about that, Nikki. What does that tell you? Where guys today are like wouldn't wouldn't even acknowledge the business now. No, because well, I'm a smart ass. I'm a smart ass. I when I say that to people, when we this comes up in a conversation, I'll say, and and the reason is I always enjoyed watching the Three Stooges. I just never wanted to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But no, but and part of the problem though. Too less, and I think Nikki, you'll understand this too, especially now. Um, you know, you've got corporate wrestling. There are no territories. There are no more. 
to me, the nuts and bolts of a wrestling promotion. And Nikki, you you and I have talked about it with Davey O'Hannon and yes. Scott Casey. Yes. There are no more promoters. There are no more bookers. There are no more these the nuts and bolts of a, of a wrestling company are your booker, your promoter, your announcer. Uh, well, the see, they don't have bookers. Was, they have like well, WWE's got as many as four, I guess forty riders for the whole setup. Well, but how many of those riders? Uh, the point is, none of those riders have ever been in a ring. That, exactly. That's exact. That's exactly the point. The, and the other point is, to my point, you never had writers. You never needed a writer. Your booker was your writer. Well, uh, of course, but he was also a rest, usually an ex wrestler as well, exactly. or a current or a current wrestler for that matter. But well, I, I mean, the po- that's, yeah, that's, just, uh, I've always said. I've always said. If you gave, if you brought Ernest Hemingway back from the grave to be a writer for me, I said I would use him because he obviously is a creative genius. But I would have a wrestler sit down next to him with a red pencil to keep him in bounds. Exactly. Because he doesn't understand the business. Exactly. Very exactly. Good. Um, to that point, uh, I had a writer on the show recently. Um. Uh, a gentleman named Vince Russo, who was the head writer for uh, World Wrestling Entertainment uh, back in the 90s. The guy who created the Attitude Era. This guy got lucky. And he knows he got lucky. Uh, a guy, again, a guy that's never been in the wrestling business, but he knew how to write. And he got lucky at a time when wrestling needed something. Wrestling needs a shot in the ass now. He uh, he proved and another Nikki. point too. Uh, they'd always told me all the years I I worked, you couldn't kill the business, and he proved that you couldn't. He tried. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Nikki, pick up on that. Well, I, I want to take it a different direction. What you were saying, it needs an enema. Is what it really needs. Not a shot in the arm. It needs an enema because. Well, you know what? Every I just in general stop and think. Everything's been done to death. Yes. Every spot has been done 6,000. Well, you know, it, it's like, is a dive special anymore? You see it in every match. No. Multiple times in some, right? It's, uh, you, you know, example, I tell young guys, I see, you remember the first time you saw your girlfriend naked? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, you remember the 300th time? Don't even bother to answer. I know the answer. Yeah. No, you don't, because mm-hmm. it becomes commonplace. And if I see all this same stuff over and over and over again, it's of no value. It's right. knowing when to use it and when to when not to is part of the part of understanding and the art of the of the business. Les, one of the the things that that Nikita and I talked about on the last show, and we had uh, our friend Davey O'Hannon was uh, was joining us uh, for that show, and uh, and and Cowboy Scott Casey was on the show with us as well. We talked exactly about what you're talking about. You know, um, you know, when you have a, a, a match where the opening spot is is a quadruple, uh, a quadruple, a flip off the top rope with a half gainer uh, and a spike into the. I mean, you know, and that's your opening move. Where do you go from there? Do you set yourself on fire? Mm. Which, by the way, one guy actually did, stupid bastard, but he did. He actually, he actually set, set himself on fire to get heat. And, well, see, no they're, they're trying to... I'm the, not the, shitting. They're, That's they're trying real. to top, top them. Sure, but they're trying to top themselves. And at some point, you can't. That's why... That's also why book, bookers uh, didn't have lifelong jobs, right? Because, a, well, I've, a, a booker... At some point, he can. Part of his job is continue to top himself if he's doing well, and at some point, he can't. He has his ceiling, his limitations, just like everybody else. And so now you're seeing every, the same over, even more so, right? I mean, I, we're all limited in terms of physically how much we can do, but it's a, just a matter of. When, when, you know, I tell kids today, one of the, one of the best workers of modern times is, is uh, Mark Callis, the undertaker, because he understands timing and psychology. He hides his weak points, 
and plays to his strengths, and he's protected his character. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it's the, paid off, the hasn't it? That- Yes. Yes. It no, I was just going to say one of the one of the things that I'm I'm really curious about is you're talking about bookers. We have uh, Karen McDaniel on the show recently, and you know, uh, in his career, Wahoo was one hell of a booker. Um, he comes from one school of booking, and then you've got the other school of booking, which is the Dusty Rhodes school of booking. Both guys were wrestlers. Both guys were bookers. In Dusty's case, we know that he booked himself a lot and booked himself over a lot, which made enemies of some of the guys in the locker room. Wahoo, on the other hand, never booked himself in a match while he was booker. That's a fact. And you can check it out. That's factual. Here's my question. I've worked with Eddie in a lot of territories. I never worked around him when he was booking, so I couldn't, I couldn't say one way or the other. But. Yeah. So, but here's the question I have for you. Maybe uh, uh, less you and uh, and Nikita can can share your experience on it. Um, booking, uh, you know, a, a wrestler slash booker. Good idea. Not a good idea. Benefits and drawbacks. Well. You know, when I broke into business, virtually every booker was a wrestler, and and for the most part, uh, probably you know still active at the time. Uh, let me just uh, well, Leo was a referee. I mentioned Garibaldi; he was a referee. Uh, Louis Tillet wrestled. Oh my God! Um, yeah, sure. You, you know, Lester Welch wrestled. Eddie Graham wrestled. Um, of course, when we when we had this ter- Ron, when Ron had the territory here. Uh, all the bookers wrestled. I mean, every every booker that was a booker. I won't run down the whole list, but yeah. for the most part, your bookers wrestled, you know, or or had been wrestlers. So to me, uh, yeah, sometimes they overused themselves. Uh, you know, in many cases, that was not uncommon. Um, but you know, overall. Uh, what made them good bookers was the fact that they had been, you know, smart workers, you know, and, and understood well, Les, from, from that the, angle. Les, what about the criticism uh, levied toward the, the late Dusty Rhodes about him being, uh, for lack of a better word, and forgive me for, the, uh, for, for being selfish, uh, I'll use that word. Uh, well, you know, again, I... I I never worked for Dusty as a booker, um, when as a booker when he was a booker, um, but that wasn't uncommon either. I mean, when I say it, I, listen, I'm not condoning it or, or you know. In Dusty's case, um, you mean did he probably push himself to the point where uh, it wasn't good for business? Well, he probably did, and then again, there's. Uh, I'm not right off the top of my head, but I can probably name you five other bookers that did the same thing. So Dusty stood out because at that time uh, there was the the big deal with Vince wanting to take over the country and, and Jimmy uh, spreading his wings to do the same or, or at least, to, you know, to, to expand and get bigger. Yeah. So it stood out more. But I, and again, you know, I'm not sticking up for Virgil either. I mean, I'm just saying, yeah. you know. A lot of that in the 60s and 70s was just common to begin with. Again, is the the time frame that we're talking about relevant to this, or is it is it something that you've seen that that was ever problematic while you worked the territories? Now, granted, when you worked the territories, were kind of on their way out, but you were, you know, you were in. Uh, you know, and quite a bit of the fray where you've seen people that were wrestlers slash bookers, you know, for whatever, putting themselves. Uh, let me ask you, Nikki. Yes. The, the, I'll give you the Dusty Rhodes thing. Your <laughs> thoughts on that? I mean, good idea. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what I compare it to. The That's the bad. The good would be Gorilla Monsoon. Okay. okay. Very familiar. 
Now, you are very familiar with Monsoon. You know, oh, he sure. carried everything, of course, and it was like he didn't put himself over. He did not book himself in many matches, and if he was in it, Monsoon's match would be one minute. This is the 70s, up until 83 when Vince decided, okay, I'm going to call it. And just like Les referred to earlier, okay, maybe you shot all of your bullets. So Vince was like, now I'm going in a different direction. Step aside. We're going to do entertainment. You're a great wrestler, Monsoon. You did a great job booking. Now I'm going to show you how to do entertainment booking. So Interesting. Yes. I'm glad you said that, Nikki. Expand on that for me. The difference between... Well, let me ask you a, 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 um, a, a hot-button question first, and then I'll have you expand on it. Entertainment, good or bad in wrestling? Yeah. As as a as a word, entertainment, good idea, bad idea, to use that word associated with pro wrestling. Yeah. It I, used I, to. You and I grew up, Nikki, in the time, and even less, uh, grew up in a time when it was called, even if it was never entertainment, but they called it an exhibition. Yes. They used to use that word. Yes. Now, they've pulled the veil so far back. And not only can you see the guys in the back, you can see the janitor, you can see the electrician, you, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm parenthetically, but, okay. you know, it's, now, it's so exposed. For less, what you don't maybe know, I wrote a book called When It Was Real about the 70s being a fan and what it meant to us. And that's why, and that's how I'm going to answer Angela's question, when it was real, because we looked at it. And now everybody from day friggin' one was in your ear. It's this, it's that. It's like, I don't give a shit. I'm watching this magnificent, these superheroes coming to life. And well, they sure. captivated us. Well, that's, that's the same way. Yes, I was, uh, I was hooked on the business in front of a black and white 10-inch screen in, in a neighbor's house. And it wasn't even my television. But, uh, yes, uh, you're right. When I, uh, well, you know... God, when I tell kids this today, they, they look at me like I'm nuts. But I said, you know, I started training for my career in Boston in February of 1960. And I said, I had my first match July the 4th, 1960. And I said, you know when they smartened me up? July the 4th, 1960. When I got on the Greyhound bus in Cincinnati to go to Boston, uh, I I looked. I, I knew there was showmanship, and and I knew I'd heard of people say I believed, and nobody, mm -hmm. you know, I, as I was around because I helped set up rings and and this and that, but uh, nobody talked in front of me really. But uh, but you know what? As I figured out a little bit, uh, or I thought I did, I wasn't about to say anything because I knew somebody kicked my ass if I did mm -hmm. and show me I was wrong. So I just kept my mouth shut. But yeah, the the day of my first match is when I got smartened up. Now, Les, so, you work for Santos, right? Yeah. Now, see, I I seen a lot of advertisements, and it would just be Santos. That was Santos presents professional TV wrestling, and they always made sure it was TV wrestling because that's but he never had television, as far as I know. <laughs> No, he really? did, but, you know, WWWF star. So it was like, yeah, that's who we're going to come to see. We're not going to just see, like, some nobody. It's like, we're going to see the guys on television that we watch every Saturday. It exactly. was great. That is, to me, I, I really uh, take my hat off to you. That's wonderful to work for a guy like that, Santos. Here's well, you know, uh, 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 Rufus R. Jones broke in there. By the original beautiful Bobby, Bob Harmon, who's also a Cincinnati boy, uh, broke in there. Dusty broke in there nine years after I did, but he broke in there too. Wow. Um, Pat. Well, I'll tell you what. For uh, Pat Patterson and I worked <laughs> together there in 1961. Pat was just, you know, he was uh, just had a few, a couple years under his belt from, you know, Canada. I wrote, right. worked with Terry Garvin there. Uh, yeah, there were a lot. Of, but you know, that's the other thing too. We had, as, as a, a green kid, 19-year-old kid, I had all these great veterans to work with. Yes. These kids today don't have that. It's the blind leading the blind. Right. You well, know? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, 
you know, I'm just just back, let me. I'm going to back up for a, for a half a step, and then I want to talk about the training aspect. You know, when when Nikita Brezhnikov does a movie as as an actor, he plays a part. He gets shot in the movie. You know, he's not really getting shot. You know, he's like playing a character, and he's expected to play a character because he's an actor. But when an a wrestler, here we go. The difference between a worker and a wrestler. But when a wrestler plays a character, and now he's trying to act like a wrestler instead of be a wrestler, you end up with stupid segments where a guy, and Nikki, we talked about this before, in fact, on the last show, where a guy has his eyeball fall out. Mm-hmm. And he <laughs> catches his eye. And now you know it's a, a fish bobber. Mm-hmm. It's a painted fish bobber, right? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. That's not wrestling, brother. They know that's not pro wrestling. Well, the the fiend that they do in WWE is, uh, you know, he materializes from the the, the swamps and crap. Oh, that's God that's geez. no, it, it's you know, it, and it, no, it's not. And <laughs> the the point is, it's not really good theater either. That. And th- that's the problem. That's, my, that's, that's exactly Most of the that's, comedy is not funny. It that's is sophomore, exactly it's sophomoric point. and stupid. And, uh, well, you know, you can't. But the whole idea is it's the business is, is now a big is corporations that own it, well, right? And that, that Sinclair, WWE. Be, huh? That, that ties also in to what we're talking about, about training and you know who's teaching them? Who? Where are they getting? Who's teaching them this stuff? Well, you see, here's the where thing. Uh, this is America, where we all want a deal. So you got, you, you want to get the cheapest deal you can get. Yet well, we yeah. all know you can't buy a Cadillac for the price of Chevrolet. But these kids will. Hey, that guy, that guy, will train you for five hours a lesson. Whoa, I'm gonna. That's where I'm going. <laughs> And see, and that's the difference. Now, when I when I sold my my company in two thousand and two, at that point, I you could you could come train with with me for six months for four grand, and that was four times a week, uh, three hour sessions, and uh, you know, kids. And I mean, we did business, but anymore, uh, there's. Well, here's the problem. It's like watering down the alcohol, <laughs> the booze in your bar. Yeah, uh, yeah. This guy comes to me. I've got 60 years in the business. So uh, this guy comes to me, and after a few weeks or, say, a month or, or whatever, six weeks, two weeks, two months, whatever, uh, I've yelled at him once too often. So he, screw that, I'm out of here. But I'm going to I can rent that, that warehouse over there, and I'll buy a ring by God. I'll set up my own school. So now he can teach two months worth. And some, so some kid gets mad at him and leaves and he starts, you see what I'm saying? And, yes. and they all yeah. say, I'm a trainer. I'm a wrestler. Oh, I'm a trainer. And the other so oh, boy. Well, I, I, I make a joke out of it, Rudy Gonzalez, but I always say, Rudy, there's more of them than there are of us. And their numbers are growing all the time. And it is true. Yeah. It's, it, there's no guy. There's you know. There's no guidelines. And well, again, you know, here's the here's the thing though. What what's frightening to think about? What's really frightening to think about is that they have a training center in Florida. WWE has this multi million dollar. I mean, it's high tech. This I've worked there. Is, yes, I've been I've been there as a guest coach. So yes, yeah, I well, know you exactly know, this, this what is it is. State of the art shit. And and but what's coming out of there is is far less than state of the art. When you got a guy, well, like this Nikita this Brezhnikov. I can let me let me let me let me cut you off right there because sure. I wasn't I've I've worked for the corporation as a trainer when I had HWA in Cincinnati. I'd worked with Vince and and doing magazines for WWF back in in the late seven uh, in the yeah. Uh, yeah the late seventies. But anyway, and I know you worked uh, with my uncle. Who was who? I know you worked with my uncle. Which uncle? Bill Zacco. What? Oh. No, I never met him. Nope. Really? No, no, wow. no, never did. 
never did. But anyway, what One I was going to say. Never met him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. But uh, now I've lost. Where I forget where I was going. See, I. But I can say I'm old. I can get away with that, right? There you go. Uh, what was I talking about before I was so rudely interrupted? The, damn it. I'm so sorry. WWW. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, uh, you know, I I've, I've worked with Vince for uh, you know uh, numerous times over the years. But here's the thing, I I know it's a corporation. I know they have rules. So I didn't know what to expect. When I ran my school, I ran it my way, right? I mean, within gu- obviously we had guidelines. They they paid me, but uh, you know, it, nobody came and told me you got to do it this way or that way. So when I got got down there to do my week, I said, "Is there anything specifically you want me to do, or anything you want me to sh- steer away from or shy away from?" No, right. do what you do. Impart knowledge. And I was left, to, you know, and in watching, working with the other coaches, I worked. I well, I, I met all the coaches, but I worked more with uh, uh, Carino and Terry Taylor. In fact, I helped Terry get his feet wet here in Knoxville years ago. But anyway, uh, the coaches teach right, the right way. Uh, I'm not sure. <clears throat> the problem, I think, sometimes is, is the guys. They need to get out of there and work with people outside the system. That was the other thing, too. See, I broke in in Boston, but then when I went to Indianapolis, and from there I went to uh, Calgary, and from Calgary back to Indianapolis, and then to Kansas, and on and on. It was like going to a different school every time because I had all these veterans in those places to work with. And these kids today don't have that, and they're – and. They can all learn. Well, everybody that went to my school learned my system, but yeah. uh, it's not. They're spread all over the place, opposed to all being in one place, like you are if you come out of the PC, if you come out of the yeah. performance center. Sure. Am I making sense? I hope. I don't oh, know absolutely. I but I tell you what, the, you, there's no substitute for good old fashioned practical experience. And uh, my friend Nikki Brezhnikov. Was you never went formally trained to a wrestling school, but you, Nikki, learned the old fashioned way on the job training from one of the best with Nikolai Volkov, yes. And then most of the times managing Nikolai, then he would be in the main event. So we're working with Snooker, we're working with Bundy, we're working with Neidhart, we're, you know, all of these people. So it's like, man, this is great. And I, like I told you before, I walked in saying, oh, Nikolai, I've been watching this shit for 20 years. I know what I'm doing. He's like, you don't know what the hell, which, hey, you know where the door is, the shit house yet. I said, okay, <laughs> let's see. And he was right. And it was like, wow. I learned quick, shut the mouth and open the ears and everything worked beautiful. But, you know, I'm going to give you a good example. Uh, Jim Cornette, he said it best not too long ago about uh, comparing different styles today, yesterday, and he brought up my idol, Chief J. Strongbow. He said, and he didn't say it disrespectfully. He says, I don't get it. He said, Strongbow, he go out there and all he'll do is throw out his chest and make a look and dance around the ring and the place is popping. These guys are going out here busting their backs, busting their asses. They can't get people to stop yawning. He's like, but he got over that's a master craftsman. That's somebody that can work. That's what we need, work. Nikki, it's called charisma. Something that doesn't exist anymore. The chief could do that. He could look at you a certain well, way. You know, you know, with these, what you're seeing with these kids, though, is uh, there's just so many cool hand signals and the rest of them looks ridiculous. Or that everybody has to have a, a particular way to walk or shake their ass or climb the ropes in a different way or, uh, you know, uh, and the point is, is all that's cool, but if when the bell rings, you can't work, it don't matter. <laughs> I mean, Les, let me ask you a question along that line, because you, you just led me into a perfect question. When you trained guys, were you a big fan of the leg slap? No, I never taught. I don't teach leg slaps. No. Okay. Uh, and, and I've told guys. Well, you Bobby, uh, what Bobby I'm Eaton used about, to. These. These Bobby Eaton used to slap his shoulder. Right? Oh. He's throwing that right-handed punch. He'd slap his right shoulder with his left hand or something like that. But anyway, 
No, I, I, you know, doing it over and over again, I, I can now, I can get you in a side headlock and set you up in a certain way, and I can throw an uppercut up under your chin, and I can pop the inside of my forearm off my so- sweaty side and make it sound like a rifle shot. Yeah. Uh, and you, but, but I only do that once or twice in a match, so I don't stand there and do it repeatedly, so you might figure it out. And that's the other thing that goes on now, too. You know, uh, they were talking about uh, doing some, I, somebody brought up uh, wrestling two's uh, big knee. And they said, well, you know, he used to slap down across the guy's back. And I said, yes, but here's here's a couple of things you don't realize when you say that. First of all, by slapping down on the guy's back is like he's driving the guy into the knee. So yeah. that made sense if you break it down. Yeah, I said, and, but the other thing is he only threw one knee in a match. Yeah. So it wasn't like they were slow. You know, you, you weren't going to figure it out because he didn't do it 15 times. And that's the other thing. These kids do the same stuff over and over. They oh my throw God, these, yeah. they throw we, so many punches sometimes that half the punches don't hit. Don't and touch then anything. Not selling it. And then it looks even stupider. Exactly. Nikki. Exactly. Because I tell you, Stan, Stan the Man Stasiak was the best that I ever seen at throwing that punch and yeah. that sound effect. It sounded like he cracked the guy's skull. And oh my somebody God. Took yeah. it, sell it, Chief would sell it. And it was like, wow. But Les He'd make right. it sound like a rifle shot, Nikki. Yes, and Les is right. He didn't do it the whole night. He gave me one time, boom, and that was it. And then we're moving well, on. Yeah, when I, met, when I mentioned me popping the, uh, you know, uh, my inside of my forearm off my side, Throwing that uppercut, I first time I saw that was Pat O'Connor, and doing somebody else, and and this was like my my first in my first maybe uh, less than a year in the business, and I thought, oh my God, he's potatoed the hell out, of but, <laughs> but he hadn't hit him at all. As a matter of fact, yeah. you know, hadn't touched him. But and that's the other thing when I lock up with some of these kids. They train with, you know, and I'll say, Jesus, are you mad at me? No, sir. What? I said, loosen up. My God. This yeah. is a work. They, yeah, everybody uh, works so tight. Les, uh, we're in a strange kind of um, juxtaposition right now with this, uh, this crazy corona thing going on and wrestling not being able to have, like, live crowds and, you know. And I have this theory, and, and I, want, I want you and Nikki to chime in on it. I want, I'm really curious to see what, what your thoughts are. I have this theory that you could get away with no audience in just about any other legit sport but wrestling. You, for, in, in my opinion, if you don't have a crowd in wrestling, you don't have wrestling. You could get away with it in MMA. Baseball. You don't need a, a crowd to watch a baseball game because they're going to play anyway. Or football, basketball. Wrestling is completely and utterly fan driven. It's fan interactive. They're a part of your show. When well, let you me, see let the me guy just... standing on the ropes and he's raising his hands and there's nobody in that arena. That's stupid to Nikki's point. It looks stupid. Yes, it does. And having the paid employees cheering is, is kind of goofy, too. Now, oh, this exactly. Thunderdome thing, because that's what America's Got Talent is doing, is, is better, except it's a wall of sound. No, I was, what I was going to say is, and, and here's my, I'll give you my reasoning. Our generation, my generation, could work better with no people than the current generation because here's the reason the current generation works for the cheap for the pop and you can see those guys at first when they first started working with the empty buildings is they'd stop and get that because they're waiting for that pop and it's not there but with our gener with gen with the guys in the 60s and 70s we you know, the pop or the crowd reaction was actually secondary to telling the story. It it came because we told the story. 
Am I making sense? Yes. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. It, okay. It, it came, the re response in the audience came because we told the story. And these guys are waiting, are just, well, I just did this cool spot. You're supposed to, this is where you cheer, or this is where you do this or that, right? And it's not happening. So they're not equipped to work in that environment. Not that we wanted to work in that environment, but I've never worked to a complete empty house. I worked to a few I thought were, but uh, no. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I think our generation would have come out. And, and again, this is not about, you know, back in my day thing. It's just a difference in, in the psychology and, and the way the matches are laid out. Les, I got a question for you and Nikki. What can we learn from studio wrestling back in the 50s and 60s? God, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. what. Um... Think about something. Back in the day, and, and, and Nikita, you'll, you'll really appreciate this being a, a kid of the Northeast. We had a, a wrestling show on from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Studio Wrestling. Right. And and it was seen in, in this area. Um, they had maybe eight to ten people around the ring. But the back wall, this was the this was the catch all. The back wall was painted with an audience. There was an audience painted on the back wall. Wow. Like our like, studio yeah, here in Knoxville. Back okay. when Fuller had Southeastern, we had that, too. We had Ex Exactly. Yep. Ron talked about it when he was here. He sure did, Les. Ron talked about it when he was here. Yeah. I uh, remember Southeastern it. did it, and uh, uh, Pittsburgh Studio Wrestling did it. Well, I wrestled it. I wrestled it at Pittsburgh Studio. I'm trying to think what year that would have been. Probably... Oh, hell, 63, maybe? 62, Probably 63. 63 Somewhere. Somewhere 64. Uh, Nikki, when did Bruno win the title off of Buddy? 62. Now, May, May 17th. Now, in Baltimore, they had Channel 11, WBAL, 50 people. They were all people in the studio. It was a local one-hour show. And it was like, okay, so we definitely, we, we got the... Not ambiance, but the uh, let's say it was a close knit. You got the fan reaction. You, you know, you got your TV matches, but still they love to see that talent. That Haystacks Calhoun coming in, Bruno, people like Blassie when they bring him in. You know, it was like yeah. that was well done because yeah. you got the reactions. It was that small, quaint group. They're right there. And the yeah. camera was able, you know, in those days, we don't have the high-tech shit like they have now. It was just one friggin' camera. But still, you were able to pan the crowd, pick For out sure. like, uh, Mrs. Krieger. You know, she would go to Philadelphia, the Garden, and Baltimore, where she lived Baltimore. And there you go. She was not paid. That was legitimate emotion coming from that lady. And, and Well, you you know, yeah. I, you know, I've heard all this story about paid fans, and I don't, don't, don't know of any. In Hell the 20 no. years that I worked. No, no I, promoters, Les, there ain't well, the happen. noise, the noise you got out of the fans back then is a different type of noise. Now these people are just well, they were they've been educated by sports entertainment to be a part of the show. So, yes, you know, you I, I've said if I were booking in this day and age, on, on you can't really tell in that environment whether somebody is actually. Um, over or not. I mean, because, well, let's face it. If you're sitting home watching, let's say Raw, for example, every Monday, and you got tickets, they're coming to your town in three months. By the time you get in that arena, you know that when so-and-so comes down the ramp, you chant this. Or when the so-and-so does this, you do such and such. Yeah. And so it's been part of the show. So does that mean that person's over? No, not really. No. So uh, it, it's really tough to figure that out, I would think, if you were trying to actually, you know, determine uh, this guy is over more than so-and-so. The fans are programmed almost like a radio station program. Well, sure. Fans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're responding to music and they're responding to what everybody else is going for. So you, you got exactly. it. Exactly. Pavlov's dog. For you. Here's a... 
Here's a curveball for you, brother. Here's a curveball for you. Why was George Goulish not a bigger star? <laughs> because he couldn't work. Which Thank probably be the biggest <laughs> reason. I told Scott Teal. I told Scott Teal that. And Scott said, well, he was a decent athlete. No, he couldn't oh. work for shit. Are you kidding me? And his father was the promoter. And that's yes. why he got over it. Because his father was <laughs> yes. Well, it, no, one of my dearest friends and a, one of the one of the wrestling cousins when he and Kirby and I did that gimmick, Dennis Hall, uh, was uh, George's partner for quite a while. And knowing, having, li you know, shared apartments with Dennis and traveled and worked as his partner, I know that when somebody would screw up in the ring, Dennis would get quite aggravated. And so I used to tease him. When I, you know, after he would spent so much time with George, I said, "Just how much volume do you take before you go to the ring each <laughs> night?" With <laughs> what do you mean? Oh I said, "Well, God. it's the only possible way you could survive the way he works, Dennis, for Christ's sake." Arguably, the 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 worst professional wrestler ever to step in the ring. Oh my God! Uh, you... Possibly, well, I, I I don't know. He, Maybe. Well, he's up there, less for sure. He, Yo, oh no, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to take the trophy away from him. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I can think oh, of a few God, in the in the. I can think of a couple in the last twenty twenty five years that could fit into that category. I'm telling you what. Well, let me ask you, brother. Um, will we ever see a return? They they say that things come in cycles. They say everything old is new again. You know, history repeats itself. You know, things along those lines, right? Will mm. we go ahead to, to uh, arena wrestling, to house shows, to to uh, to, to big crowds of fifteen or twenty thousand thunderous people cheering on a, a super villain or a hero? Are they no. are those days gone? I think so. Uh, well, and the reason. Uh, I can sit here and watch more wrestling uh, than I'll ever need for $10 a month on the WWE Network, right? So why would I pay 15 bucks to park, $100 for a ticket, mm. 8 bucks for a beer, when I can sit here and, uh, you know, for what? Watch WrestleMania for $10 and, uh, and be, yeah. not stand in line for anything. So that's well, part and of you it. Know what? I, and I, plus, I, they, I get plus what when saying. they give you so much on television. See, we never gave. We use TV to draw people to the house shows. There you go. And they don't use they don't use TV to draw people anywhere. They're 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 well. Hell, Vince is making more money on television. You realize uh, this pandemic. He, uh, they're has still going to have the biggest year they've ever had because know, of the Fox. Crazy because of the Fox contract and stuff like that. So, I mean, they're, you know, in that respect, they're not going to hurt at all. But yeah, uh, but, but the, bus the I, business is going to hurt because if every, and, and when you say sports, it's all sports. Anybody that's got a TV show on a national network is sports entertainment. I don't care what yeah. they say. I But I'd love to see wrestling come back. It would be clever, I think, if somebody actually had an alternative to all this other stuff. But anyway, uh, no, I, I think that uh, if the numbers keep falling, and, I mean, even the new companies, I mean, AEW is doing okay. Uh, but, um, you know, like anything that's new, it'll subside at a certain degree because people will take offense to something there or whatever. But, yeah, it's all sports entertainment. It's, you know, it's, it's AEW is just a... a a different comedy show than WWE and WWE is yeah. a different comedy show than ring of honor. That's, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> comedy. But here's what, here's what saddens me. You know, wrestling will survive in some fashion or form. Here's what, here's what hurts me though. The fans are going to die. The fans are dying from starvation. They're, they're starving for their wrestling. You're talking about, you know, we're spoiled, you know, well, see, yeah, but you're you're talking about you're talking wrestling. about grown ups, 
but the demographic, like yeah. AEW is getting the big demographic for the uh, the 18 to whatever, was it 18 to 29 or 18 to 39 or whatever the hell it is, the people that spend the money. And that's yeah. that's what the TV stations are concerned with. Yeah, right? but there are also people and, that are still living they, in their mother's basement. Well, here's the funny thing. The WWE is getting the older generation. They're getting the demographic of the old the people 50 and over. That's and, a scary fucking thought, brother. I got news for you. Well, it, that's a it's scary true. Thought. It's true. That's the numbers. I, 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 I don't live and breathe by those things, but the networks obviously do. Uh, but yeah, they're they're getting more of old. But I, I I don't know why, except that some of the stuff AEW does is goofier than what Vince does. So, Nikki, who knows? Take us take us uh, home, brother. I, I believe they're hoping the older generation, like we are, that is going to go back to what we used to believe in. But there's nothing to believe in. Not just believe what we're seeing, but like believe in a character. We believed in Bruno. We believed in Chief. We hated Lou Albano and the Valiants. Today, nobody cares. They just say, okay, it's done, change the Well, it, it, yeah, it's even booking. That's the problem. I mean, it's, they're not push. you know, you beat me, I'll beat you. You beat me, I'll beat you. You, you yeah. know, it's, That's and, and here's the other thing, that, that being a champion doesn't matter because oh, yeah. they swap belts like some people change clothes. Exactly. Well, that's another right. thing. There's, it's a, the belts now are a marketing gimmick. That's all they are. They're tools to sell to you know to kids at five hundred bucks a pop. They're not cheap. Those things are not cheap. I got news for you. And oh, it, I know they're not. It meant something. And they're much. making a fortune. A tag team championship change was a big deal. It was like, wow, can you? Um, and you didn't want to dare miss a show. Because you thought a tag team belt might change, or even the heavyweight belt. That's why when they yeah. did it in Baltimore, if you remember, Ange, back in the 77 with Bruno, it was like... Oh, my God, and superstar, sure. You know why? Because Maryland State Athletic Commission had a rule that once a decision's made, it can't be changed. So there, Bruno got yeah. screwed, and that was it. Live with it, superstar's your champion. We hated it as fans, but it worked. It was beautifully done. It was like, oh, it was genius, brother. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thought, well, not just Madison Square Garden has heavyweight title changes. It could happen anywhere now. So it gave you hope as a fan. You guys still there? We're here. Yeah, still here. Yep. (laughs) Okay. We can, I can hear every word you're saying. Go ahead. All right, no, I was just, I was, you know, you said take us home, and I thought maybe you'd already gone home. No, not yet, not yet. But I, I will take you home here. Les, it was an honor to talk with you. A lot of good insight, and I'll tell you what, stay healthy and keep on doing it, man. You're not done. Well, you, you guys stay healthy, too, and I've enjoyed Thank the conversation. You, you are an icon, a legend. You're a welcome guest here anytime. Uh, we only have an hour tonight, but I'd love to bring you back for uh, one of our uh, famous roundtable episodes. Nikki's a, an expert at our roundtables. All we right, cool. Yeah, we'll do that together. at some oh, point. God, That'd yeah. be great. That'd be oh, great. I'd love to have you. Les, thank All you right, so guys. much. I'll, I'll touch base with you in a day or so. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Take, care. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, Nikki. You got it. All right, Nikki. Take care, my friend. Enjoy your dinner. Okay. Take it easy, and I'll uh, I'll see you on the flip side. Happy wrestling, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.